Welcome back. It is the Multimedia Chronicles X-Men 3 Rant, Part 2. The first two were so good. So good. Where did it all go wrong? Well, as I sort of touched on in the last one, the first thing that went wrong was hiring Brett Ratner to direct it. I am getting really sick of this trend, okay, that seems to be happening all over the place. Hollywood sees a comic book that they see potential in turning into a live-action movie and making gazillions of dollars with. So, What's the first thing they do? Let's hire a director who knows jack shit about comic books. That makes sense. And not only jack shit about comic books, but jack shit about the source material, the actual comic book that he's adapting into a movie. Another example where this happened was the Eon Flux movie. Yeah, remember that one? <clears throat> now those of you out there who have seen the Eon Flux cartoon will know that it's one of the finest examples of animated television to come out of the 90s. It was great stuff. Brilliant. Brilliant show. So when I heard there was a live-action movie, of course I was thrilled. But then I watched it and I was like, this bears little to no resemblance to the cartoon. There was elements of it in there. And Charlize Theron looked great as Eon. And uh, the, the other one, uh, I can't remember the character's name, the chick with the hands on her feet, the, she looked great. You know, the effects were really cool. The visuals were really cool, but it just didn't feel like Eon Flux. Then I watched the extras on the DVD. You know why it didn't feel like Eon Flux? Because not a single frickin' member of the crew watched the show. Then what are you doing working on that movie? <sighs> you kept seeing in the featurettes of Eon Flux. Yeah, we didn't really watch the show, but we did this. Yeah, I didn't really watch the show, but decided to do this. It's like, what are you doing working on this movie? So back to X-Men 3. Uh, <clears throat> X-Men 3. Okay, let's try to keep it organized here. We'll break it down into points. Okay. Point number one. Bad choice of director. You don't hire an action comedy director to do an action-adventure drama based on a comic book. Pure and simple. Bad, bad decision. I'm sorry, Brian Singer, but you lost some respect points for that choice. If, in fact, the press is right and it was actually your decision. I'd really like to hear some clarification on what the logic was with that decision, because clearly, Brett Ratner had no idea what he was doing. Point number two. Now, I concede that when adapting a story from one medium into another medium, certain changes necessarily have to take place. And they did that with the first two, I thought, very tastefully. There were changes made, but they were changes that weren't bad changes. It still felt right. It still felt like X-Men. So why, in the third one, did they make so many changes to the the, the, source, the, the stories that they were adapting from the original source material that were completely unnecessary. It's not that they t made a few changes to make it work in the movie, okay, in a movie version. They completely threw out a good chunk of the legacy of the comics that fans know and love and hold dear to their hearts and just made all these stupid changes not making changes for the sake of making it easier to adapt into a film, but rather taking a big steamy dump all over the legacy of the comics for no logical or apparent reason whatsoever. Why? Okay, so let's get into some specific things. Specific things that were wrong with it. Point three. In a word, Phoenix. Now, when I saw the end of X-Men 2, I was really excited because Jean Grey dies and then you see 
the hint of the phoenix in the water as the camera's flying over the water. And I was like, oh man, they're gonna do the phoenix saga next. That's gonna be awesome. And for all intents and purposes, it should have been. But no, instead, what do they do? They turn Phoenix into just basically Jean Grey going crazy for no apparent reason whatsoever. Coming back to life for no apparent reason whatsoever. And teaming up with Magneto for no apparent reason whatsoever. Killing everybody in sight for no apparent reason whatsoever. Okay, in the original comics, this is the way it happened, in a nutshell. The Phoenix Saga is massive in the comics. It's massive. It's one of the all-time great sagas of the comic books. It's one of the most fondly remembered and revered sagas of the comic books. It's been reprinted in trade paperback form countless times and is really easy to obtain. I highly recommend you track it down and find it and read it because it's great stuff. Now, in the original comics, Jean Grey didn't die and then become Phoenix. No, it was a much bigger story than that. Basically, she was chosen by this alien race to be host to the Phoenix Entity. The Phoenix Entity was this alien presence of some kind that basically took possession of her body, enhanced her powers ridiculously to help them and the X-Men fight in this war against a bunch of aliens. It was a huge, huge epic saga. What ended up happening was after the war was over, after everybody had won, after all was said and done, the Phoenix didn't want to leave Jean Grey's body. The Phoenix stayed in Jean Grey's body and wanted to take control of it and be her. And it was this whole big thing for a long time. In the end, Jean Grey ended up dying. So basically, she originally became Phoenix and then died, and then came back later through completely... That's a completely other story. Um, which would take far too long to go into, but this, suffice to say, it was a huge epic storyline with just countless layers and facets and major events occurring throughout it. Not the least of which was the death of Jean Grey, who was actually one of the original X-Men members from way back in the 60s. So that was a huge deal, that, uh, that she had died. Which, um, so anyway, the, the, so there's this beautiful epic story that could have made, I mean, you could have taken elements of it and condensed it down into some workable form and incorporated that into the movie. But instead, no. They took the Phoenix legacy, the Phoenix character, and just crapped all over it and basically turned her into a glorified thug with psychic powers. Like, give me a frickin' break. That's ridiculous. Point four. Speaking of deaths, why did all those characters have to die? Why? What, what was the point? Because Brett Ratner heard in passing that, oh, apparently they kill off major characters a lot in the comic books. We should do that in the movie. It'll be cool. The fans will like it. Yeah, in the comic books, it happens within the context of a story. It happens for a reason. It happens with purpose behind it. You know, sub point one, under point four, Cyclops dying. What the hell was that? That was ridiculous. I don't care if he was a pansy, I don't care if he was a dick and everybody hated him. He was a major character and deserving of at least a modicum of respect for his frickin' death scene. That death scene was pathetic. It almost seemed like he was killed as an afterthought so he could go off and do the Superman movie. It's like he shows up, Jean's alive, he's like, oh my god, Jean's alive. She walks up to him, kills him, the end. Like, what the hell? Um, I, I think it was Harry Knowles, actually, on Ain't It Cool News, raised some really good points about that whole scene and why Brett Ratner fails as a director in this kind of thing. If Brian Singer had done that scene, it would have had emotional resonance. It would have had impact. You would have felt something. Even though it's Cyclops and you hate him, you'd still have tears streaming down your cheek because he's a good fucking director and knows how to milk an emotional scene for all it's worth. Brett Ratner, on the other hand, just added it as a fucking afterthought and didn't even let the scene breathe at all. He basically just threw those two characters together, had one kill the other, let's cut to another scene, come back, we'll find his glasses later, and that's it, done. Bye-bye, Cyclops. Uh, Sub so point two. Why did Xavier die? Why? What was the point? Why? Because the stupid, fucked-up Phoenix character was so out of control that basically anybody who came anywhere near her was going to die, regardless. Basically, the character that bore little to no resemblance to the original comic book character who else died? I don't even remember who else died. I don't even care. This is how little impact these scenes had. 
A bunch of people died in the movie, and I don't give a shit. Because they were directed poorly and lacked any emotional resonance whatsoever. <sighs> Speaking of things being added as an afterthought. Point five. Angel. Why was Angel even in the movie? Don't get me wrong. I love Angel. In the original comics, he's one of the original X-Men. Angel rocks. Angel is one of the guys who helped make it happen. He later became Archangel and was forced to work for, uh, for Apocalypse. Yeah, for Apocalypse, for a while. And um, I always get mixed up in my head between Apocalypse from Marvel, who is a character, and Apocalypse from DC, which is a place where Darkseid is. Anyway, <coughs> um, yeah, so anyway, that's neither here nor there. The problem I had with Angel in the movie was his story was given so little screen time. So little screen time. It's like, we meet him, he has some conflict with his father, he does some stuff, and, you know, comes to terms with some stuff, and then that's the end. It's like, what was the point of any of that? That, once again, once again, a case of moments not being allowed to breathe. Emotional resonance not being exploited to the maximum potential of the scene. Now, there was tremendous potential in the whole conflict between Angel and his father and such, and it was just not explored at all. Completely wasted opportunity. Shouldn't have even been in the movie. Waste of screen time. Looked great. I was happy to see Angel. I wanted to see more of Angel. But, you know, completely wasted potential. Waste of screen time, waste of time. <sighs> Speaking of waste of screen time, point six. What the hell was up with the whole scene with Magneto moving the Brooklyn Bridge? Why? It took so bloody long to just happen already. And why? Why did he need to do that? He's the master of magnetism. I'm sure there's plenty of... I mean, for God's sake, in the second movie, we saw him extract iron from a guy's bloodstream and use that to get out of his jail cell. I'm sure there's enough resonant metal in the water that he could use to rappel off of and just hover across the bay to the island. It would have taken, like, ten seconds. Instead, we got ten frickin' minutes of moving the Brooklyn Bridge. Screen time, I might add, that might have been better spent on character development. Perhaps expand on the Angel storyline if you want to have Angel in it so frickin' bad. You know, <clears throat> why was that scene in the movie? It was completely lacking any point whatsoever. It's like, we're gonna do this big elaborate special effect just because we can. Ha ha, look at us. We have gajillions of dollars that we can waste on stupid pointless special effects sequences to try to dazzle you and distract you from the fact that this has little to no plot. Point seven, small one, but significant in the grand scheme of things, I think. Based upon what we've seen of Magneto and Mystique's relationship in the previous two movies, he would not have blown her off so nonchalantly like he did in the third one. I'm sorry, out of character, way out of character, and not cool at all. All right, not cool at all. Point, what are we on, eight? Point eight. <sighs> Once again, wasted potential. When I went in to see X-Men 3, I had really high hopes when I saw the opening scene. The whole Danger Room sequence where we got to see a Sentinel in action, where we got to see uh, Colossus and Wolverine do the fastball special, I was like, oh yeah, I can already tell this movie's gonna be full of so much fan wank, I'm gonna be like unconscious with excitement by the end of it. But no, because after that super cool opening scene, it takes a serious left turn into what the fuckville. <sighs> now here's the problem with that opening scene, okay? Here's the problem. There's a sentinel in it. Why is that a problem? You think, what? What's wrong with that? Sentinels are cool. Sentinels rock. Sentinels hunt down mutants, and we get to see lots of cool fight scenes involving sentinels and mutants. Oh, yeah. Fastball special all the way. Woot woot. Here's the problem with it. How the fuck do they know what a sentinel is? How do they know what one looks like? Huh? 
When I first saw that opening scene, my first thought was, oh my god, they're doing Days of Future Past. Days of Future Past, for those who don't know the comic books, was basically a story that involved an alternate future timeline, where we got to see X-Men in this alternate future where Sentinels, these gigantic robots, basically tools of the government designed to hunt down and eliminate mutants. So the X-Men have been reduced to this band of, like, freedom fighters trying to liberate the world of, of mutants from this oppressive rule. It was really good. It was like a Terminator kind of future with, you know, X-Men as, um, you know, outcasts and such and having to, and you know, rebels and whatnot trying to just survive. And I thought that's where they were going to go with it. And then I thought, oh, okay, it was a Danger Room sequence, but there was a Sentinel in it, so they must know what the Sentinels are, so we're going to see some Sentinels in this. Now, here's my thing. I think, based on what we saw in the first two movies, in particular the second one, where they're really starting to push for control of mutants and stuff like that, I thought it would have been a logical continuation of the story to have the Sentinels figure into it in the third one, because that would have been perfect. You know, sort of the big step that human kind takes against mutant kind to try to control them and oppress them and that would have been a perfect logical continuation they could have done like this huge epic battle spanning across the city with you know the x-men beating the crap out of sentinels could have spent all the money you spent on the fucking brooklyn bridge sequence on a bunch of sentinel animations that would have been awesome but no and quite frankly Going back to Phoenix for a second, if that's what they were going to do with the Phoenix Saga, if that's all they had time for, they should have left her the fuck out of it. Just leave her out. You've got enough characters to carry the movie. Just leave her out. Give Famke Jansen a break for a movie. Bring her back for the fourth one. Do the Phoenix Saga in the fourth one. And do it properly. You know? Wasted opportunity. Squandered potential. Why? There was no reason for it. If people had just read the frickin' comics... Just read some of the significant storylines, the historically favored ones, you know, the favorites, the fan favorites. The favorites of the people who actually give a shit about the characters and the world that it's set in. <sighs> the other thing was they call it like the last stand, like the last battle, the war has come. That wasn't a war. That was like a bunch of, you know... Good mutants fighting some bad mutants on an island in the middle of the bay. Who cares? That had no weight to it at all. There was no... Nothing was at stake. It was basically, if both sides killed each other, the rest of the world would keep on going. There was nothing at stake. Point nine. The Cure Gun. What the hell was that all about? Now, I'm not saying that there wasn't ever a cure for being a mutant in the comics. Yeah, there was. But it was done tastefully. It was basically there was a possible cure that could get rid of your mutant powers and make you just a normal human. But they presented it in a tasteful and interesting way and emotionally challenging way. Uh, you know, lots of moral issues like, oh, if I could, would I and should I and all these, you know, all these conflicts went on. It was great. Um, <clears throat> but instead they turn it into a fucking cure gun. Give me a break. That is like a, a, a total Hollywood plot device of bullshit that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever within the context of the comics. So why did they do that? Simple, for convenience. Because whoever the hell put together the story for that was lazy and didn't bother to read any of the source material or familiarize themselves with it at all. <sighs> That's pretty much the major things. Point ten. One thing I did like about the movie... Beast was really cool. Kelsey Grammer, awesome as Beast. The whole thing where he was hanging upside down reading, beautiful. I just about creamed myself. That was great. Well, figuratively, in a fan wank sort of way, not literally. Because that was like right out of the comic books, and I loved it. And yeah, anyway, Beast was awesome. Would I recommend you see the movie solely based on the strength of Beast? No. Finally, there's the DVD release. Now, with X-Men 1 and X-Men 2, we got, like, pretty decent special editions of both of them with, like, lots of really cool extras. X-Men 3. Many of you may not know this. They released it with a collection of no less than 20 deleted scenes. And I thought, ah, maybe the deleted scenes have the good stuff.
that they just didn't have time to fit in the theatrical release for whatever reason. But then they pulled that version off the market and released a watered-down version that only has like seven deleted scenes. Why? What, what was the point of that? Now there was the promise that, oh, the version with 20 deleted scenes will come out later. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, here it is, like, what, three years later, and we still haven't seen it. Well, it feels like three years anyway. Yeah, so I don't know if that one's ever coming out. But honestly, I've watched those deleted scenes, and I don't remember anything about them. And that, to me, says, well, they weren't that significant then. Well, how long has this gone on? About a million years. But there was a lot to go into. But you know me, when I rant... I make it good. Well, I make it count, anyway. I make it good and ranty. So that was my X-Men 3 rant. And I'd just like to say a special hello to Decadent 7. Hello, Decadent. I know you're watching, and I know you've watched right to the end, which is why I put the, the thank you and hello at the end, because I knew you'd see it. The reason I say hello to Decadent 7 is we, we bitch about X-Men all the time. And we just talk about X-Men, stuff we like about X-Men things like that. But one of the things that actually prompted this video was I ranted about X-Men 3 a number of times in my Stickam chat room and uh, Decadent suggested I put it on video. So here it is for you, the rest of the world to enjoy. So I hope you all enjoyed my rant on X-Men 3. Next time, next time. Not sure. Probably another rant of some kind, because they're easy to do, and it gives me lots of videos to put up. <laughs> anyway, hope you enjoyed the X-Men 3 rant. Feel free to agree or disagree, I really don't care. The bottom line is, if you're familiar with the comics, chances are the movie ticked you off, because they really bastardized the comics. If you're not familiar with the comics, and just like the movies as movies, maybe not so much. But honestly, I feel that even as a movie... X-Men 3 did not work successfully. The first two worked great. The third one, they completely ruined it. And I really hope with the fourth one they get some other director who actually knows what the fuck they're doing to, uh, to take the helm. Because if a franchise is, is almost in desperate need of a reboot, it's X-Men. Because they really had a good thing going and completely messed it up with number three. Anyway, I'm done. So thanks for watching, and until next time... Sayonara.